Hey guys, today we're going to be looking at Kepler's law. We're going to be looking at the law of orbits, the first law, the law of areas, the second law, and the law of periods, the third law. Now, I've also included a, an example of the application of Kepler's law outside of planetary motion. So keep watching. I've come up with a simple way to remember Kepler's law. Instead of soap, it's loap, L-O-A-P. So that's law of orbits, which is the first law, law of areas, the second law, and law of periods, the third law. Let's get into the first law. Kepler is a, was an astronomist, a German astronomist, and he worked on the heliocentric, based off the heliocentric model. The heliocentric model is the model where the sun is the center and the planets are orbiting the sun as opposed to the geocentric model. The geocentric model was a model before the heliocentric model where people believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system and the Sun and other planets and stars were circling around the Earth. So this is based off the heliocentric model. The first law states that it's the law of orbits and it is called the law of orbits because planets move in elliptical orbits. Now Kepler stated that the planets don't actually move in a perfect circle. They moved in elliptical orbits. So this is the shape of the motion of the planets around the sun. They're not a perfect circle. The second point is that the sun is the focus of these orbits. The focus meaning the sun is the fixed position here. They don't say the sun is at the center because the sun is actually not at the perfect center. It is off-center, as you can see in this diagram. It is slightly off-center. So we don't say that they moved in ellip elliptical orbits with the sun at the center, because it is not. But the sun is the focus of the movement, meaning the sun is the reference point. The planets move with the reference point of the sun, with respect to the sun. So that's the law of orbits. When we study the law of orbits, since they are not moving in a perfect circle, we form these two axes. So we have the minor axis, the horizontal axis, um, the vertical axis, which is the shorter axis, and then we have the major axis, which is the longer axis of the two axes. We have minor and major axis. When the minor and major axis are almost the same length, then the shape of the orbit is more and more becoming a perfect circle from an elliptical shape from an oval if the major axis and minor axis are almost the same length then we can say that it is almost a perfect circle and most of the planets in the solar system actually have a near circular perfect circular orbit so this would mean that this is important because then we can use the calculations of circular motion to determine their motion and their orbital radius and the orbital periods which we will look at later. Now the second law is the law of areas. So the law of areas stipulates that the line that connects the planet to the sun. So this, assume this blue object here is a planet and this is the line that connects it to the sun. The line that connects the planet to the sun sweeps equal areas. Sweeps equal areas means okay, this planet is moving in this direction. So this planet is moving from here to here. And this is the same planet, but now it's come all the way here and it's moving from here to here. So this is the movement of the planets. And this line, as the planets move, this line is sweeping the area. It is sweeping the area. So the area that it sweeps, okay, now let's say this on the left hand side, the light blue area, this planet took 30 days to get from this point to this point. And then on the right side, the green area, the planet took 30 days as well, to, but to get from this point to this point. Okay, before we go on to areas, I want you to know the speed. Now the linear speed is faster at this point because it has covered a larger distance compared to this point. If it has covered a larger distance in the same amount of time, then the planet is moving faster here. So when the planet is nearer to the sun, then it moves faster compared to when it is further on this side. 
Now, the law of area stipulates that this area that is swept by the line connecting the sun to the planet, this area here, this blue area here, will be equals to this green area that is swept by the line that connects the sun to the planet at this point. This area is equals to this area if they are in equal times. For example, here 30 days. So the planet has taken 30 days to travel from this point to this point and 30 days to travel from this point to this point as well. Then we can equate the areas. So this is the law of areas, Kepler's second law. Kepler's third law is the law of periods. Now, the law of periods, we need to understand two terms first, orbital radius. Orbital radius is the radius of the orbit. Remember, it is an elliptical shape. So this radius will be longer than this radius, or this radius, and this radius. So the radius is not the same. The radius will only be the same if it is a perfect circle. How then do we calculate orbital radius? Which radius do we take? Now, the answer is we use an average of all the radius. The radius, remember the radius is measured from the center of the sun to the center of the planet. That is the orbital radius. And so we take this radius, and we take this radius, and this radius, and we take all the radius, and then we get an average value. So when we talk about orbital radius in the third law, we are talking about the average radius. So we assume that it is circular, and we take that radius. Orbital period is the time taken for one complete orbit. So it is the time taken for this planet to make one full orbit around the sun. That is the orbital period. Now coming to the third law, law of periods. Kepler's third law states that the square of the orbital period is directly proportional to the cube of the orbital radius. It's as simple as that. The square of the orbital period is directly proportional to the cube of the orbital radius. So this relationship is very useful in calculations. Now let's look at an application of the law of periods. So the third law. Now let's say this is planet 1, the red planet, and then there's a blue planet. So this would be Mercury and Venus, for, uh, first and second planets from the Sun. Let's look at Mercury, the red planet here. So the red planet here has radius R1. R1 is specific, the radius to the red planet. T1 is the orbital period specific to the red planet. And then we have planet 2, the blue planet. So the blue planet has a radius of R2 and a period, orbital period of T2. So we know that T square, orbital, the square of the orbital period is directly proportional to the cube of the orbital radius. This is Kepler's third law. When we want to make it into an equation, then we have to add the proportionality constant. So it will become T square is equals to KR cube. Now when we insert the values of orbital radius and orbital period for the red planet, we get T1 square equals to KR cube, R1 cube. Then we rearrange K, we get T1 square over R1 cube. This is the value of K. Now notice the difference with these two equations. This is the general equation. This is talking about the general relationship between the periods square of all the planets and its radius. This is a general equation. This is a specific equation. Now we are putting the values for this red planet here because this law applies to all planets. So when we put it for the red planet, K is a constant. K does not change. Then we can do the same thing for the blue planet. And then we find that K is T2 square over R2 cube. Now notice we have K is equals to this and K is equals to this. So we can, therefore we can equate both of them. So at the end of the day, this is what we get. From this relationship, we know that the square of the orbital period of a planet over its radius cube, orbital radius cube, is equals to the square of the period of another planet over its own radius cube. This is the relationship that we get. This is the equation that we can get out of this relationship, out of Kepler's third law. And this is how we is very useful for calculations. Now let's look at an application of Kepler's law 
outside of planetary motion. So Kepler's law can be applied for anything else that has orbitals that has circular motion. Okay, two objects that have circular motion that are moving around the same object. Two objects, circular motion around the same object. Then we can apply Kepler's third law. Let's look at this example here. So assume the center is Earth and this red circle is the satellite. This blue circle is the moon. Now the moon with an orbital radius of 3.48 times 10 to the power of 8 takes 27.3 days to orbit the Earth. So this moon takes 27.3 days to orbit the Earth. How high should a satellite be to orbit the Earth in two days? Now this question is asking you for the height of the satellite. The height of the satellite if it should orbit the Earth in two days. So in this case, notice that we have two objects that have circular motion around the same object. Both the moon and the satellite are orbiting the Earth. In this case, we can apply Kepler's third law. So how do we apply the law? First, the relation in the law is the, orbits, the orbital period square is directly proportional to the orbital radius cube. And so we have this equation and we already know that we can come up with this equation because they are directly proportional. So first write down all the values given to you. So R2, this is the moon. So the orbital radius of the moon is this value. Its orbital period is 27.3 days. Now we don't know the orbital radius of the satellite. We have to figure that out. And then the orbital period of the satellite is two days as required by the question. So here, there's one thing to note when we are doing calculations. With all calculations, you must ensure that the units are the same. So if you are using days here, then the unit for orbital period here should be days as well. And if this is in meters, this should be in meters as well. Whenever we are using a directly proportional relationship, the actual, the actual units do not matter, but they must match. So here, this is a direct directly proportional uh, relationship. So here, when we use that relationship in this equation, whatever unit we use for period must be the same and whatever unit we use for the radius must be the same. It doesn't have to be a specific unit. It has to be the same. So here, if days, we use days, meters, we use meters. Now, when we rearrange, our goal is to find the orbital radius of the satellite. So when we rearrange, we get R1 cube is R2 cube multiplied by t1 square over t2 square. Insert the values and we get r1 is 6.09 times 10 to the power of 7 meters. Now this is the value of r1. Now notice that r1 is the distance. It's r1 is the orbital radius of the satellite. It is the distance between the center of the orbit. In this case, it's the center of the Earth to the object itself. So the center of the Earth to the satellite is the orbital radius of the satellite. The question did not ask you for the orbital radius. The question asked how high, how high up should the satellite be? So we are looking for the height above the Earth. So the radius is equals to, the orbital radius is equals to the radius of the Earth and added with the height. And so, orbital radius of the satellite equals to R, this big R, capital R is normally used to represent the radius of the Earth, plus the height, the height of the satellite above the Earth. And therefore, H is equals to the orbital radius of the satellite minus the radius of the Earth. And the value, the radius of the Earth will normally be given to you. And the value that we get is 5.45 times 10 to the power of 7 meters. That's all for this video, guys. I hope you've learned something today. As usual, if you haven't subscribed, please click the subscribe button below. And if you learned something from this video, please give me a thumbs up. See you in the next video.